Hello, everyone. <laughs> Our next speaker is the founder of Grief Beyond Belief. She's a school counselor by day and a super activist by night. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Rebecca Hensler. I'm going to have to get used to this TED Talk thing. So yeah, I'm the grief lady. And I've gotten kind of used to being the grief lady. And particularly, I've gotten used to being the grief lady at secular events. So this has a, been a little different for me. I've done uh, two grief-related events yesterday. I uh, facilitated a grief support workshop. And then at the end of the day, I facilitated uh, Nikki Massey's memorial. Um, but I also got to have this amazing experience yesterday, which was that uh, Ingrid Nelson and I talked about the history of ACT UP, uh, the AIDS activist movement we were both involved in 25 years ago. And um, we also talked really about how what we learned back then can really offer guidance and inform what we do now going into the next four years. Tonight, I'm not going to talk about the activist uh, part of my life much. I'm sort of going to talk about the next chapter. Um, when I was an AIDS activist, like most people in that movement, I had some sort of job that was really supporting my activism. But I slowly transitioned into having work that really was informed by the work we had done in ACT UP, which was as an HIV counselor, as the person who counseled someone before they got tested for HIV and then gave results. Um, and that was an amazing job. It, it was extraordinary work, but it was also heartbreaking. And people always assumed it was heartbreaking because I was be giving positive results all the time. And that actually wasn't it. It was heartbreaking because I was constantly working with people whose lives were so fucked up already. And so I transitioned. I, I realized I had to sort of start working with people earlier in their lives. And so I had this sudden revelation that's a hysterical story that I'm not going to tell you guys, that I should be a school counselor. And literally Googled California school counselor to figure out how the hell that was going to happen. Um, and so I've been a school counselor uh, since 2002. And um, it it's really, it means everything to me. And it does, and not just because of what I can do for other people, but because of the experiences that I've been able to have. So I want to talk some tonight about being a secular queer school counselor. Um, and I am, of course, going to talk some about how we work with kids in this time of terrible crisis. Um, back in... Um, Two, around 2007, um, I was really going through a transition um, to into becoming a secular person, um, into just giving up all the ridiculous sort of made-up beliefs I had had. I, I was kind of woo. I believed in some sort of higher power. Um, and I have this very vivid memory of graduation 2008, and sitting there and watching the kids prepare to graduate. And every year before, as I had done that, I'd in my head offered a prayer to whatever it was I believed in to look after these kids. Um, and there I was, graduation 2008, and I realized I no longer believed that there was anything out there to look after them for me. And it sank in that what they were 
taking forward into their lives from me was just the things, whatever I'd been able to teach them that they actually remembered. Um, that was a very hard thing to accept. And it stayed hard. I mean, I've had two former students who've been shot. Um, one of them was shot dead by the police. Um, I have many former students who are in jail or have been in jail. It is hard to send kids out into the world knowing that there is nothing looking after them for me. And I know that that's going to become harder. So that's the hardest part of being a secular school counselor. But I really want to talk about some of the joys of it, because it's this amazing thing. Being a school counselor is great, and being a secular school counselor, and having the ability to, in various ways, sort of plant a seed of skepticism. I'm not there to teach kids what to believe. No, no one in the schools is supposed to be there to teach kids what to believe. And it's quite horrific when you hear that someone has. Um, I remember one year I uh, was talking with a kid and about another kid who had been so disruptive in class. These are middle schoolers and oh my God, middle schoolers can be impossible. So the kid I was talking about was literally a kid who thought it was funny to like, walk into my office and fart and walk out. That was the level of, like, behavior we're talking about. And so another student was saying, oh, he's so difficult in class. Ms., and he mentioned his teacher, had us pray for him. And I was like, she did what? He's like, yeah, she said we needed to pray for him to improve his behavior. And I went straight to the principal. I'm like, <laughs> I told him what had happened. And he turned to the kid and he said, well, did that offend you? And the kid kind of didn't know what to say. I'm like, it offends me. It's illegal. She can't do that. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we're a San Francisco middle school, and there isn't a lot of that in San Francisco. Um, so, but I do get to have these amazing conversations with kids about what they believe. Um, I work at this incredibly diverse school. The school I work at is diverse, and by diverse, I do not mean like, well, there's, you know, it's mostly white kids, but we have some kids of some other ethnicity. I mean, literally, we have kids who, in their home, speak and hear, I think I once, one year I counted 18 different languages. The languages that I can remember, um, let's see, we have kids who speak English, Spanish, Portuguese, Mayan, Russian, French, Tagalog, Samoan, Tongan, Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, Arabic, Hindi, and Urdu, and a few more I can't remember. And some substantial percentage of our kids are either immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants, and I will talk more about that later. Um, we have obviously male and female students. We also have students who um, are transitioning in one direction or another, or who knows. We have students um, who, we didn't used to have any class diversity at all. We used to be, the kids would say, Ms. Hensler, are we a ghetto school? We were a school that was, regardless of anything else, entirely a school in poverty. There were some kids whose parents were working class, um, but no one had much money at all and substantial number of our kids lived in housing projects. Um, that is no longer true. It, this is one of the things that I struggle with all the time. The school is gentrified, and which causes some serious complications. It turns out it's actually easier to work with a population of kids who are all poor than a population of kids who, where half of them are poor and half of them are substantially wealthier and their families are, and the wealthier families are moving the families of the poor out, which is a huge struggle. Um, 
We also are a very diverse school in terms of ability. We not only have a really substantial number of kids with various learning disabilities, we have a classroom of students who have like severe physical impairments. We also have a classroom of kids who have severe mental health issues. So it's really a, working at a school with that much diversity, people think of it, oh, that must be hard. It actually is, is a much brighter, more wonderful experience because there are so many differences, because then you get to talk to the kids about their differences. And I kind of do that every chance I get. I mean, it can even be just like, School counselors get called in to cover classes all the time when suddenly the teacher has to leave the room or has a meeting or go home sick and they need someone to cover the room. And sometimes there's no lesson and you just have to make it up as you go along. And so I remember a time where um, what I ended up doing, I think it was Dia de los Muertos that day. And so we just started talking about like first the uh, Mexican-American students were explaining the holiday and what it meant. Um, but then we ended up talking about uh, death rituals and traditions from all over the world. And I was learning so much. And the kids were learning so much from each other. And that was just this, it's, it's fantastic because you start seeing the ways in which beliefs are similar and beliefs are different. And you kind of hope in the back of your head there's at least one or two kids thinking, well, these things can't all be true. And so you're hoping somewhere in the back of someone's head is like, wait a second. Um, but also, you know, just knowing that there are all these different beliefs, I think, really contributes so much to these uh, these kids going forward into their future. Um, in that same classroom, actually, they did this amazing project. It's a perfect project for a school with that much diversity. Um, it actually was called the Culture Project. And the Culture Project was a poster and a presentation about your family's culture or cultures. So it would be about your family's country or countries of origin, um, the foods your family liked, the, the holidays your family celebrated, um, the beliefs your family had, and, um, and then these kids would present this to the class. And one day, I actually was lucky enough to be in the room while, uh, while some of them were presenting. I seriously had no idea this was going to happen. And the kids mostly, when they would talk about their family's beliefs, well, my family is Catholic, you know, my family is Christian, um, and then one girl, this one uh, Chinese-American girl said, well, my family doesn't believe in God. And then she said, we like to make our own miracles. And it was just a lovely moment that I've never forgotten. So again, the diversity of the school is really, really, really its strength. So this conversation I like to have with the kids about, about death and death rituals can often get very interesting. Um, last week, again, it was uh, Dia de los Muertos, which is the time of year I tend to have it. And I was talking with some students who I'm training as peer mediators. And um, so this is a group of seventh graders and eighth graders, and we're going around the table and we're talking about what is, because this wasn't like about the rituals, this was really about belief. And I said, you know, what does your family believe happens when you die? And so we're going from person to person, and one girl said, well, we're Catholic and we believe in heaven and hell. And there was something in her face. And I said, do you believe that? And she paused. And then she said, now, when you die, you're dead. <laughs> and it just entirely changed the tenor of the conversation. And we continued from that point, not just asking what does your family believe, but also talking us about what you personally believe. Now, sometimes these conversations can be really, really challenging. Um, I also had this conversation recently uh, with a club called Diversity Club that I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and one of the girls 
said when I asked about death belief, she said, well, I see dead people. I talk to dead people. And the other kids sort of started commenting on it. And you could tell that any time there was any question of someone not quite believing her, she was getting very agitated. And so that could have been a very difficult situation, but I took it as an opportunity to talk with them about the difference between believing something for yourself and knowing something was true and telling other people that they had to believe it too. And so I really had to both talk with the other students and say, this is, you know, she's not saying that this is the world. She's saying this is how she experiences it and then saying to her, you don't get to tell other people this is what is. You know, you can talk to us. The question is, what do you believe? Um, and, you know, it's funny because the, I can see that this is going to be a challenging thing with this student. Um, and I've had that before, not necessarily with death beliefs, but like a couple years ago, I had a student who believed that there was a demon who was kind of haunting her or stalking her. It was a little slender man-ish. You could tell some of it was like from things, sort of cultural stuff that she'd read. But also, you know, in that situation, um, one thing that's really challenging is when you have a student who has what's clearly a delusion. And this was really impacting her. This wasn't a kid who was just like, isn't this neat, I talk to dead people. This was a kid who said she couldn't go into certain rooms in the school because he was there. So the hardest thing was that her mother believed it too. And so having to work with the mother where I was trying to get the student help because she clearly did have a, a, a delusion that was both caused, I think, by her anxieties and then also resulting in ever-increasing anxiety. And as a school counselor, you know, of course, my instinct and my job was really to recommend that she, you know, that she get mental health services. Um, and that's a very hard thing to do when the parent that you're talking to actually thinks that the, her child is being haunted by a spirit. Um, but that is, uh, you know, that's not a typical thing. Um, often with um, eighth graders, one of the most exciting things is that eighth grade developmentally um, is really a time of individuating from family. And some of what that means is that at that age, um, teenagers tend to turn away from a focus on their family and the, you know, the influence of the family to the influence of their peers. But it also really means that they they kind of go inside themselves more and really think about what is it that I believe. And so I have had a number of experiences with kids coming to my office or coming up to me on the yard and just saying, Miss Hensler, can I talk? You know, my family believes this and I believe this. Um, and it's often that just that first moment that they're having of being able to talk about it. It's kind of a form of coming out and it's very exciting to watch. Um, I have this note here, it says, another weird thing. So I'm gonna talk about another weird thing clearly, um, which was that I was having a conversation with a bunch of students um, about, it was at Easter time. Um, and so we were talking about Easter and Easter traditions and I kind of feigned, you know, I'm. I'm I'm a secular Jew, and, and they know I'm an atheist. And I kind of feigned ignorance. I said, so, so what, tell me, what's Easter about? And they all were like, well, rabbits and <laughs> uh, Easter eggs. And um, 
And I was actually sitting there with this group of kids and with two other educators, um, one of whom is Catholic, and she, so you could sort of see on her face she was getting a little disturbed. And, and I said, no, 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 I, I know rabbits and eggs and stuff. And yeah, it's a spring holiday. And I thought, oh, this could be great. We can talk about, you know, how spring holidays are similar from culture to culture. But I thought, well, first let's sort of get through this what's Easter about thing. I said, no, no, no. What, what event in, in uh, Jesus' life is about? How many of these students do you think could name what event in Jesus' life was commemorated by Easter? About zero. Eight students, almost to all of them some version of Christian, most of them Catholic, and seven, uh, sixth and seventh grade, and not one of them knew the, that Easter was about the resurrection. And we, I mean, we gave them plenty of hints. They just couldn't get there. And so that was really interesting to me because it, it also kind of gave me a sense of the degree to which sort of how deep the belief and how deep the involvement of the, in the church goes for many of these students. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Diversity Club. Um, I have this awesome, like I said, I work in San Francisco Unified School District. And in San Francisco, um, the school district has this amazing program that has been around the whole time I've been there, and I think maybe five years before, uh, I think it's going on 20 years, um, where every middle school has what's called an LSL, a uh, LGBT support liaison. And it's a position that's stipended that you do on top of everything else you do, which is a lot. Um, and it's specifically both to support individual uh, LGBTQ students, but also to help create a, what's called a safe and supportive school, how, help create an environment in which students feel safe and supported. Um, and so one task that the LSL is uh, responsible for is running a club. And at some schools, and at the high schools, that tends to be a GSA. But um, I felt two things. One, that, um, that I knew that the term, first of all, GSA at the time, now it tends to be, uh, stands for gender and sexuality, but at the time it was Gay Straight Alliance, and I felt like that was very, uh, not, not a very inclusive name. But I also knew that we were talking about middle schoolers, and that bringing middle schoolers into a club with gay in the name was going to be very challenging. Um, and so I started thinking about it and thinking about the school I was at, and I, I developed both the name Diversity Club, but also the idea and my philosophy behind it, which was that we would use the diversity of the school and the profound understanding that all these kids from all these different cultures had of their own oppression of the ways they had been discriminated against, of the ways that they felt that they had been made invisible by the culture around them, that we would use that understanding to build empathy for uh, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, and questioning students. Um, and it's been, I feel, it, it was a very successful strategy. Um, and it's still something I use all the time, talking to kids about, um, for example, talking to kids about a history in which most of them, except the new wealthy white kids who are now in our school, um, but, you know, up until five years ago, I could talk to a room full of kids and truthfully say, you know, 50, 100 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to be, many of you wouldn't have been able to get an education at all, and you certainly wouldn't have been educated in the same space. And being able to talk to them about that and about their right to an education and the right to an education is a constitutional right, and then 
um, being able to explain that when you have an environment that it feels unsafe and flat out dangerous to lesbian, gay, bi, trans, and questioning kids, that in fact you are abrogating those students' right to an education. That if someone does not feel safe enough to learn, then that is actually going against their rights. And that's something that these kids are really able to understand, and they're able to understand it because of their own experience. Um, so Diversity Club, I approached it as a club about the diversity of the school and understanding each other's cultures. And it led to all these amazing conversations with these kids because it, we did talk about LGBT issues. And for example, every year um, we tend to have a conversation right before Thanksgiving, what would it be like to go home and your parents um, that you're gay or lesbian. And um, that's always a fascinating conversation. And more recently, there are actually, there's almost always one or two kids who are like, well, my parents already know. Um, or I've talked to my parents about it and they say they'd still love me if I was. Or my parents told me this, you know, without me even having to bring it up. Um, but there's also a substantial number of kids who have talked about how because of the religion that their family believes in, um, that that's something that they could never tell their parents. Um, and sometimes they tell these very tragic stories about you know relatives who, well, my aunt told my mother she's gay and now she doesn't come over to the house anymore. And so those stories can be very sad as well. But we also have these just incredible conversations about sort of different topics in a variety of cultures. Um, so one of my favorites is tattoos in different cultures, because it turns out that tattoos have these very different meanings in different cultures. Um, we also talk about things that can not really be talked about elsewhere. Um, I had one very challenging conversation with a group of kids who were starting to tell me about things, things they thought they knew about sex. And that made me ask them, I said, well, when you have a question about sex, sort of where do you go for the information? And they said, oh, the internet. And I was like, okay. Um, and I was sort of thinking, you know, okay, there are websites with good information on sex um, that's, you know, written for kids and teenagers. Um, I said, so where do you go on the internet? And they said, porn. <laughs> These are seventh and eighth graders. And they said, porn. That's where they were getting their information. Um, that was a challenging day for me. Um, we also, there was a day that we talked about abortion, and talking about abortion with a bunch of middle schoolers is actually, um, it's, it's pretty intense because you, you can tell that no one has ever opened up that topic for them. That is not something that kids of that age have conversations about, and that you could also tell that many of them had done some pretty serious thinking about the topic. We also just had conversations about family structure. Um, one of, uh, it was actually one of my favorite conversations with them. It was, you know, I mean, and some of that was because like the kid with two moms telling us, you know, well, I have my mom and I have my other mom and then my dad and sort of explaining to everyone how a queer family structure could work. Um, but also there were kids just talking about interesting things that I didn't know about sort of how families from different cultures structure themselves. And I'll never forget one of the Samoan kids saying, um, <sighs> Well, you know I don't like? Every time someone comes from Samoa, they move into my house. <laughs> it's like, 
And it was fascinating because you realize that this kid really had this, it felt that way to her. San Francisco has a kind of large but very, very tightly knit Samoan community. And so it really felt to her like any time anyone came from Samoa, her father said, move in with us. Um, over the years, we really have been able to transition to talking more and more about LGBTQ issues. Um, one of the things that happened was that in 2010, which was the year where there was the series of extremely well-publicized uh, suicides of teenagers who had been being bullied. And I'm not gonna, you know, I'm a skeptic, so I'm not gonna say all of them killed themselves because they were being bullied. We know that lots of kids get bullied and do not kill themselves. Um, but in fact, you know, and there wasn't, for there were a lot more names um, that you'd see on the internet. I actually went and did some of the research, but th there was substantial evidence in a number of those cases that they had been being bullied pretty severely and that the bullying had involved anti-gay language, even though, you know, only about, and I don't remember what number, but not all of them were actually gay. And that year on uh, social media, there was this uh, proposal that sort of developed, um, at this point, like the gay community muckety-mucks sort of take credit for it, but it was very much a grassroots movement that everyone on this particular day, October 20th, should wear purple to show that they were against anti-gay bullying. Um, and so we participated in this at our school and a really substantial number of our students wore purple. And, um, and instead of just having it be that one year, it's become a tradition at our school. And Purple Day is, is a very moving thing. Um, the kids get excited about it, it's kind of fun. You're all wearing purple, it's neat. Your teachers are wearing purple. Um, but they're also, we do things to help them think about what it means. And so I created this thing called the Purple Pledge, which is just this big piece of paper that says, um, I promise not to use anti-LGBT language. And it's basically a pledge to not use anti-LGBT language for a year. Um, and every year a growing number of students signs this pledge. Um, so we're really able to do these anti-bullying activities that are sponsored by the Diversity Club. Um, and then also it's really led, we have an LGBT Pride Assembly and which has provided an opportunity for students who really do want to come out publicly. And um, there was this one girl who came to me and said, I want to come out at the assembly. We all in the club knew she was a lesbian, but, um, but she was not out publicly. And she said, Ms. Hensler, Ms. Hensler, I want to come out during the assembly. And I said, let's figure out how we're going to make this happen. And we made a video that was about coming out as all kinds of different things. So and kids were holding these signs with what they were coming out as. And, you know, people came out as Justin Bieber fans, and people came out as skateboarders, and people came out as gamers, and people came out as some very silly things. Um, teachers also held the sign and came out um, sometimes in really um, very moving ways. Um, and uh, like one of the biggest, toughest guys in, in the after school program said, came out as a softy, basically saying, I'm not that badass. Um, and um, many kids actually put their religion on it, which for the kids who were Christian or Catholic was not, you know, was not really taking a risk, but for the kids who were Muslim, was actually, I think, you know, must have felt somewhat scary. Um, and there were also, there was one girl who came out as an atheist. Um, and 
that was fantastic and that it just all sort of slid together so that when we showed this video, it wasn't like putting this one young lady as separate and on blast. It was really saying, we're all, we all have these things that we wish we could share with each other. And she uh, got a lot of respect for doing that at the assembly. I also got to go to her bat mitzvah that summer, which happened to be on gay day. So this, this girl, who had just turned 13 and just came out at her school uh, the spring before, went from her bat mitzvah to ride on the back of her aunt's motorcycle in dykes on bikes, which was... <laughs> Lovely. Um, best coming out story ever, I think. Um, but the stories are not always um, that easy, right? She had these amazing parents. I had another kid last year who, you know, took many, many months to really to admit um, that she was in love with this other girl who had been clear to us she'd been in love with all along. Um, and she, she would sit in my office and cry all the time she, about not being able to tell her parents because they were very seriously Catholic. And she had seen them eject other family members uh, out of the family for being queer. And she was very scared that that would happen to her. Um, the last year, the class of 2016 was the queerest class yet at our school. Um, not only were there two out gay boys, um, one out uh, butch lesbian, which is actually a very challenging thing to be um, in a middle school, um, many, 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 many out by girls, um, but also two students who are transitioning. Um, so the boy who was transitioning, by the end of the school year, I, I was working with him, um, he had told his grandmother, who was his guardian, um, but she was not, she was really struggling about it. She wanted to support him. She never once said anything about religion or it's wrong. Her fear was that he was making a mistake and she felt like she really needed to have some sort of confirmation, I think, from sort of some sort of trusted authority. I think it's very hard sometimes for a adult to really be able to hear it when a 14 year old says, no, really, I'm a boy. Um, and so that was very challenging for him. There was also a girl who was transitioning um, and really everyone in the school knew about. Um, and she, when I asked her, I called her in to meet with her because you know, I, knew, I knew she was going through this and I said, um, so what can I do to support you? And she said, I, I said, do you need me to help you um, find a doctor? And she said, oh no, I'm already starting hormone blockers. Um, eighth grade, end of her eighth grade year. And um, so, you know, I said, well, do you need me to get the form so that you can start high school as a girl so that your um, records in the school district will be changed? And she said, yes, that. And so she started high school this far, fall as a girl, um, which is. <laughs> so, um, and of course, I'm out as queer and at the school, and I'm also out as an atheist, and that's been really interesting. I mean, being out as queer at the school um, has been um, sometimes challenging, sometimes easy. Um, you know, I more live out than anything else. It's not like I ever kind of make an announcement. Um, but the very memorable thing was when my wife and I got married at City Hall in 2004. It was my first year at that school. And the kids, well, first of all, they all kept saying they wanted to go to my wedding. And of course, because the city hall, you had to like take whatever time slot they give you. I'm like, my wedding is during sixth period on Tuesday. You cannot come to my wedding. But they were still, when I was leaving, they were still shouting, Miss Hensler, we're coming to your wedding. I'm like, 
no, you're not. Um, and then there I was in City Hall, and there one of the kids was. And I said, Donald, what are you doing here? I told you you couldn't do this. And he said, my family's outside with my pastor. And I realized that his family had brought him there to protest the weddings. Um, and it was so hard. And it really damaged my relationship to him. I had a very good relationship with him, and it was hard for me to forget. Um, but then at the end of the school year, I was talking to one of the teachers about it, and I said, yeah, you know, he was at my wedding protesting outside, and she said, really? She said, he came back and told all the kids he'd gone to Miss Hensler's wedding. <laughs> so that was really a message to me, the degree to which, um, even though adult family members and the generation, my generation, might not be supportive, that these kids, the norm was to support, and that was wonderful. Um, coming out as atheist at the school, I haven't gotten a lot of shit. It's sometimes challenging, sometimes the kids, but often it's just the kids have questions. Um, one thing that's funny is kids used to come up to me on the yard and say, Miss Hensler, is it, is it true you're married to a woman? And actually last year, one of the kids, I thought that it was going to be that same old thing. Miss Hensler, I have a question for you. Is it true you don't believe in God? I was like, yes, that's true. And so it was very interesting that that sort of also becomes something that's a rumor that goes around the school. And then they asked me, what do you believe? And um, I'm actually very grateful to that girl giving the culture presentation because, in fact, I say, well, I like to make my own miracles um, because that's a really great way to explain to kids. And I say, I believe in you guys. So... I think this is the hard part of the conversation for me. Because um, I do believe in these kids. And you can tell by listening that, I mean, I love them. And, and we, we, the educators, love them so much. And Wednesday morning was excruciating. We, we all got to work. And we had a faculty meeting planned. And, you know, we actually, my faculty has been watching the documentary 13th about, um, about prisons and the disproportionate uh, mass imprisonment of African Americans. Um, and we've all been watching it together, which has been this very intense experience. And so we were going to be talking about that, but then we got there after the election. And um, we just sat and in groups and talked about our feelings about it, and then moved from talking about our feelings about it to what were we going to do to help the kids. And what we ended up doing, we actually changed the entire bell schedule of the school and moved homeroom, which is usually after lunch, to the first part of the day so that we could all sit in circle with the kids um, in smaller settings and talk with them. And uh, one of the algebra teachers, who's a brilliant teacher but doesn't, doesn't get how good she is with these kids and how much they trust her. She said, Ms. Hensler, you know, Hensler, can you come up to my class? And I said, yeah, I can do that for you. Um, and so I sat with her kids. Um, there were a few who were crying. Um, and we just listened to what they had to say and how they were feeling. Uh, one of the first questions they asked when, you know, we were about to go around, uh, one of the questions we asked them was, if you could say something to someone who had voted for Donald Trump, what would you say? And the kid said, are we allowed to cuss? <laughs> and the teacher and I looked at each other and we said, yes, you are allowed to cuss. Um, and there was so much cussing on Wednesday. It was like open season. Our rules about appropriate language went out the fucking window on Wednesday. <laughs> Literally, one of my kids, who is often walking down the hall listening to some sort of profane music, was walking down the hall going, fuck Trump, fuck Trump. <laughs> like, <laughs> and and I, I pointed to it, I'm like, uh, he's walking down the hall saying fuck Trump, and she's like, I think we're okay with that. <laughs> so, um, 
But one of the kids really, in, when I was in circle with them, after we talked about our feelings, he said, can we do a protest? And I was like, yeah, and it's so hard for me as, you know, as someone who's been an activist um, to not start saying, this is how you're going to do it. Um, but I just stopped. They said, so what is it that you want to do? And he said, I want to do a civil rights march. Can we do a civil rights march? Eighth grader, eighth graders learn American history. And I said, yeah, we can do a civil rights march. And I said, do you want to do that on the inauguration day? And he's like, yeah, we could do that. Um, so I... I think that our students probably are going to be planning something. I mean, demonstrations in middle school, it's a little different. You can't do the same kind of walkout that high schoolers do because we're responsible for these kids' safety. But I, I can see that these kids really need to get this emotion out. Um, and speaking of getting emotion out, uh, many of the kids that I work with, I specialize uh, in working with students on their behavior struggles. And so I have a specific caseload of kids who have some really challenging behaviors. And many of them knew that hidden in Ms. Hensler's cabinet was a Donald Trump pinata. And I had actually told them, um, and there was this reward. Sometimes they'd be, like, they'd be like, can I hit it? Can I hit it? And I'd be like, have a good day. If you have a good day, come back at the end of the school day and you can hit Donald Trump. And that was like, became a reward. Um, and so, um, so on Wednesday at the end of the day, uh, what I had told them for the last week was going to be the celebratory beatdown that we were going to give Donald Trump was a very not celebratory beatdown, but boy, was it a beatdown. Um, I have never seen, a, I mean, and they didn't care that there was no candy in it. They just wanted to beat the crap out of it. Um, and I have never seen, there were, the pinata was in pieces like this big by the end of the afternoon. Um, but that's getting out the emotions. And so the question is really sort of what can we do to protect these kids? Um, and that's very hard. I mean, again, keep coming back to there are so many ways in which I'm really lucky to work where I do. Um, so San Francisco is a sanctuary city, and um, you know, and we are all very clear with each other um, that we do not help La Migra. La Migra is not getting any help from us. Um, and in fact, we have a parent liaison who specifically works, um, well, who works with all our families, but um, it does, she, she's Latina herself and she works very, very closely with our uh, Mexican American and uh, Salvadorian families. And, um, and I just realized, you know, when the kids, when I was thinking about sort of questions that they have about their families, I thought, oh God, her job just got so much harder because she's there for our families and our families are really, really gonna need us. Um, you know, with kids, anytime there's a disaster or a crisis of some sort, you know, everything that you read about sort of how to work with kids, the first thing you do is you tell them that they are safe. Um, and sometimes that's really hard. You know, there'll be a, a shooting, a school shooting, and what we're supposed to do is tell our kids that they're safe. They're safe at our school. Um, and that's easy to do when the kids are panicking about the, you know, killer clown meme that they've seen on Instagram. But um, there's a killer clown out there now, and that's real. And it's hard because we do have to keep telling them that they're safe um, because they're kids. And you don't tell a kid you're not safe. You tell a kid you're safe, and then you do every damn thing you can to make it true. Um, so I don't want to end like this, though. Um, so I want to end, uh, I talked to you about Diversity Club, and one of the things Diversity Club does is it produces activists. 
like no other club. It's amazing. And one of the young women who came out of Diversity Club, I, I used to tell her she was my boss. She'd be the one who'd show up and say, Miss Hensler, it's time to make the signs for Peace Week. You know, she'd just like always be like, this is what we do next. Um, and she just started this fall at Pitzer. She is not just an activist, she's a scientist. Um, and she was involved in the demonstration at the Claremont Colleges yesterday, and so I want to show you some pictures. Um, so this young lady here is, is my student, um, and I couldn't be prouder of her. And um, these are her friends, and they all, when I told them I wanted to do this on Facebook, they said, yes, we give you permission. Um, everyone says it's okay. Um, I love this. This is Sada Shakur quote. Um, you can't see all of it. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And I just want to end with that image. So I want you to look at her face. She's angry. She's probably scared too, but I also see a certain amount of joy there. She is very, very ready for a fight. And so as much as I've talked about what we can do to support kids and take care of them, the most important thing we can do for kids now is listen to them and listen, and listen, and listen, and listen. And when they are ready to act, we need to follow their lead. Thank you.